L ladies and gentlemen, um, brothers and sisters, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately and on one of my flights we, we waited at the gate for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours before finally we were airborne. And uh, when we were flying, I asked the air hostess what the problem had been. And she said, oh, no problem. We, the pilot was bothered by some noises from the engine. And it, it took us a while to find a new pilot. Um, <laughs> and the moral of this story, ladies and gentlemen, the moral of this story is too often in education, we, look, we tinker, we, we find a new pilot, when instead we should be looking at the system. We should be looking at the engine. And what I want to talk to you, oh, the slides are so far away, can you, can you see them? Uh, anyway, I, I've got lots of visuals, I hope you can see them. Malala, Malala, you all know Malala, don't you? She was the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize. The story you all know as well, she was on her way to school when she was shot by the Taliban. But there's something missing in the account of her that uh, that is, 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 is odd to me. You've probably filled in the details when you hear the international agencies, the BBC and others describing her story, and you filled in the details. She was on her way to public school and her father, the headmaster of the public school, um, you know, and she was shot. That's not true at all. She was on her way to the school that her father had created. He was an educational entrepreneur. He had created a low-cost private school and she was on her way to private, edu private school. And this is a phenomenon that is all over the world. I discovered it for myself 17 years ago. I was in Hyderabad and I was on a consultancy from the International Finance Corporation. I'd become an expert on private education. And we all know, don't we, that private education is about the rich. Private education is about the elite. My mission in life for reasons that this conference will understand, I think, was to serve the poor. And here I was, an expert on private education, which is about the rich. So how, how do you, how do you, you know, bring those two things together? I went into the slums of the old city of Hyderabad, and the parts of my life were brought together. I found a low-cost private school. In those days, charging about a dollar two dollars per month. And then I found another and another. And soon I was in, in access with a federation of 500 of these low-cost private schools. I spoke to parents, mostly Muslim mothers in this, this part of Hyderabad. And I said, well, why do you send your children to private school when the government school is free and you get free books and free lunch to boot? And mother after mother told me the same story. In the public schools, the government schools, our children are abandoned. And I went to see one of these public schools. I went with the district education officer. They knew we were coming. And he was incredibly candid. We arrived there and there were 130 kids in a class on the floor, sitting there amongst the mosquitoes. These bright, bushy-eyed kids wanting to learn, really keen to see this visitor but doing nothing, day after day doing nothing because the teachers in the government schools had abandoned them. There were only two teachers present that day and as Malala relates in her book about government schools in Pakistan, there were only two teachers in that sort of school every day. The other teachers had a rota, they even had a rota to say when they could come and when they could leave their children abandoned. I came back to Washington DC, to the World Bank IFC headquarters here. I, was, I thought there was something quite incredible going on here in poor areas, these low-cost private schools. I came back and wanted to tell people about this. And all they said was, calm down, Thule, calm down. <laughs> You've seen maybe a couple of businessmen ripping off the poor. I thought, ripping off the poor? They're staying weekends and doing science fairs and sports fairs for these kids. They're doing extra work. But no, the idea was dismissed. So I thought there was something going on here. So I managed to get funding from the John Templeton Foundation. And we went, I went out to see if this phenomenon existed elsewhere. And we went to places like Makoko in Lagos. So visitors to Nigeria, to Lagos, when you get off at the airport, you go to Victoria Island, probably. That's where the, the posh hotels are. Um, and you go across third main bridge and you might see down there in the water, Makoko. 
this shanty town built on stilts into these dark waters of the Lagos Lagoon. And uh, I, 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 I was passing that way myself on the way to Victoria Island on my first visit, and I said, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to find low-cost private schools. And uh, my, my host said, it's too dangerous. You can't go there. Um, so the next day I went without him and we, dro we drove in the taxi and took me to the edge of the sandy town. The taxi took me there and he said, I can't go beyond here, it's too dangerous. So I went in a canoe and went around there and soon found, I soon found some children. I, I had a video and I, I, I didn't think I could show it with these screens so far apart. But I had a... I got a video of the, meeting the first kids in that shanty town, and uh, the little girl Sandra. She, we ask her where she goes to school, and she says KPS. And I say, what does that stand for? She says Kennedy. Kennedy what? Kennedy Private School. And so it's not Kennedy as in your erstwhile president, but it's Kennedy in a Nigerian name. And that was one of 32 private schools we found in that shanty town alone. Or we went to I went to to Kenya to Nairobi, to the slum called Kibera, one of, perhaps one of the most famous slums in the world. And there, when you come across a, a boy like Frank here, um, before I started doing this research, people would assume, ah, he goes to public school or he's out of school altogether. But no, go with him down into the slum and you'll find that he's there at a little, tiny little private school right in the centre of the slum, one of nearly 100 private schools in that slum itself. Nearly 100 private schools. And then all around the world, this is a global phenomenon, rural China. I was giving a talk at a conference like this in Beijing, and I, I, if any of you have been to Beijing recently, you'll realise how rich it is. But I, I said, well, you know, Nigeria, India, there are these low-cost private schools serving poor communities. Could this be the same in China? And people were a bit embarrassed by the question, to be honest. And then someone from the British aid agency, DFID, um, put his hand up and from the floor and said, uh, um, we, we work, Dif DFID works in the poorest parts of China, Gansu province in the northwest. And uh, we are, we're working in the poorest villages and we can tell you categorically there are no low-cost private schools there. So this was a bit of a red rag to this bull. Um, and I, I went back to Newcastle and as luck would have it, or as he was saying in this conference hall, as Providence would have it, a student arrived from China um, and I asked where he was from. He said, from Gansu province. I said, do you mind? If we go to Gansu province, I've got something we want to look for there together. So this student, Liu Chang, you can see him there. He's now a professor at Beijing Normal University. We went looking. We got up early in the morning, talked to mothers in markets, and we got some directions. Yes, there could be private schools here or there. We abandoned our vehicle. It was suitable only for three-wheelers. We went traveling into the mountains where people were doing harvesting like they've been doing for hundreds of years. And sure enough, at the end of this route, we came across the, a low-cost private school, People's Heart, Mingjing, where the children sang in a choir to me, um, don't turn your eyes on these beautiful people. And it was one of 586 low-cost private schools in the mountains of Gansu, which no one knew about. And everyone you spoke to even denied their existence. So this is an extraordinary picture. Just how many are there? There's a chart there. Lagos State is perhaps the most studied for private schools. Lagos State in Nigeria. There are 14,000 low-cost private schools there. 70% of children in Lagos State go to private school. Only 26% are in government schools. And in fact, that figure is typical across the urban developing world. New Delhi, Hyderabad, uh, Nairobi, Accra in Ghana. About 70% of the kids will be in private schools, including poor kids in low-cost private schools. And in the rural areas, surveys show that it's about 30%. In South Asia, my guess it's true in West Africa too. So this is a huge phenomenon, and the phenomenon has great social impact. Um, I could show you lots of tables, but you can just believe me for now that study after study shows that 
the children in the low-cost private schools outperform those in the public schools uh, when all the proper statistical controls are done and they outperform them for a fraction of the cost. So this is something really to celebrate. There's also social impact. So I could show you table after table of the schools in West Africa and different parts of the world where there's gender parity in the private schools. Gender parity. Um, but even in communities like parts of rural Pakistan where Malala goes to school or went to school, um, where you've got private schools in a village, the gender gap between those in and out of school narrows from 16 percentage points to 8 percentage points in the villages where there are private schools. So this is just an extraordinary success story that's going on in, in different parts of the world. When I started talking about this, first of all, um, there were lots of people in denial, lots of critics. People can be quite aggressive when you touch on 65 years of development uh, uh, dogma um, and, and say the poor are helping themselves in different ways to what you expected. But one of the criticisms I did take to heart, people told me, well, you've looked at Kenya, you looked at Ghana, India. These are not the world's poorest places. You can't really say private schools are good for the poor, as one of my publications said. <laughs> And I took this seriously, Father. I took this seriously and I said, okay, where are the world's most difficult places? And perhaps they're like Somalia here, where I took this picture of a, an abandoned tank. Um, perhaps they're like Somalia. Perhaps they are the war-torn places in Africa. Now, this conference is about good profit, and all the data I've told you so far, I've talked about private schools um, rather sort of running... Um, you know, rather being rather loose with my definition, are they for profit or non profit? As Igbar said, uh, non government or. I, I like that definition, by the way. I, I, I always have to fight with the international community now. I call these schools private, but following what Igbar said earlier, the development experts, they don't call them private, they call them non state, non state providers. Anyway, but we did some, we've done work now, and we've looked at how many of the schools are actually profit and non-profit and this is data from the schools we found in the slums of Monrovia itself now I don't know if you can read that but um, basically the largest chunk 61 percent of the schools we found were for profit that is they were owned by a proprietor and any surplus would come back to the proprietor him or herself rather than go to any other organization. There's only a tiny number of government schools there, but you see there's this next largest group was the private independent churches. They were the typical evangelical type churches you see in these poor communities, typically set up by a person, a you know, pastor, who then runs a school, and then the private established churches like the Catholic Church, the Episcopalian, the Wesleyan in Monrovia, they make up about 13.4% of the schools. So we have a picture, the private schools are, majority of them, and this is typical in our studies, the, the largest number of them or the majority of them are, are um, for profit. And in the Liberia Households Survey, just to remind us of that figure, 71% of the children are in private schools, even in the poorest slums in Monrovia, one of the, I guess, the poorest slums in the world. You can look at how these private schools are affordable. This is one of their virtues. This is looking again at the for-profit schools. Yes, there are fees that are expensive. So when you're thinking about the poor, people say, well, how can this idea be pro-poor if the children have to pay fees in the schools? Well, children have to pay fees, and yes, if you look at that graph there, you'll see that the fees at the private schools are many times more than the small levies that are charged in the government school. The blue is the government schools, the red is the uh, private schools. But going to school, there's not only fees you have to pay if you're poor, if you're anyone. You have to buy shoes if you're poor. You have to buy uniform. You have to buy books. You have to pay transport. All these other extra costs. And if you add those in, if you see the middle set of bars there, the cost of sending a child to a private school for the other costs actually is the same as the cost of the other costs in a government school. 
not surprisingly, the uniform books, they all cost about the same. So if, if you add those things together, the fees and the other costs, you see the combined fees there. And yes, sending a child to a private school is more expensive, but the cost to a parent of sending a child to a government school turns out a typical figure we found about 75% of the cost of sending a child to a private school. In other words, these schools are affordable and they're not much less affordable than sending a child to a supposedly free government school. I've mentioned churches in Monrovia and it, it might be worth, at, for this audience especially, showing that the established church schools, the Catholic schools, the Wesleyan schools, in the poor areas, they don't actually necessarily charge fees that are cheaper, as you'd expect, than the for-profit proprietor-driven schools. In fact, the proprietor-driven schools, we found the median fee was about 4,000 Liberian dollars a year compared to nearly 5,000 in the established church schools. Uh, indeed, oh, the, my sl slide has slipped there, I think, but the green, I got a green area, a blue and a red area there. The red area shows where a church has set up a school and there's no relationship in terms of funding between it. The blue area, which is about 34%, that shows what we expect to happen, doesn't it? A church in a poor area has set up a school and the church subsidizes the school to some extent. But the green area shows something quite unexpected, I think, to many people. The green area shows where, and it's um, about 18% of the schools we found, we, that shows where the church has set up a school, but the school subsidizes the church. There's no philanthropic relationship from church to school. The church is actually a bit of a money earner for the church itself. This is a map of Juba. You can see the White Nile there, the river down the end there. And I just want, this is really to show you that I've been very busy, this map. But uh, <laughs> if we are able to locate each of those schools carefully and based on our knowledge of Juba, there was, there's a young chap here who was in Juba. I, I spoke to him yesterday. If you, you remember Juba and you'll see that the for-profit schools, the yellow, are actually in the most difficult places to reach, the most deprived areas. The non-profits are also there to a certain extent. The government schools are in the easy areas. They're in the city centre, they're in the safe, easy areas. In other words, for-profit schools reach the parts other schools do not reach. I think there was a beer advert, something like that once. Um, now, finally, on this evidence from the for-profit versus the non-profit, this again is from South Sudan. And this graph shows the number of schools that are there and the red line going down shows when the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, was declared in 2005 in South Sudan. And as you can see from that graph, the number of schools increased quite a lot after the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was declared. Terrific. We can disaggregate all those schools and we get this rather messy graph here where that shows the private proprietor schools, the non-government schools, the community, the church, and various other, and, and the government schools itself. So you can see there's quite an interesting picture there, but the two that are most interesting, if you take them out, are the private proprietor schools, the for-profit schools, and the church schools. And what's, the, what's been happening there? You've got a peace dividend, you've got a peace dividend of, yes, churches coming in and opening schools, but even more so, private proprietors coming in and opening schools. They are the largest number. They are serving more of the poor than anyone else. So I could carry on about the virtues of the for-profit sector, but in the remainder of my time, I just want to talk about what happens when outsiders get involved in this. Um, Father said some kind words at the beginning of this, but since my research and since the publication of The Beautiful Tree, there has been a movement going on, a, a movement emerging, and lots of outsiders are getting involved in the low-cost education space now. Um, I, as, as was pointed out, I've created a, a couple of 
co-created, co-founded a few chains of schools myself, um, uh, Omega schools in Ghana, um, based just outside Accra in the community called Kaswa, which is on the Cape Coast, uh, on the road to Cape Coast, as a cardinal will know. Um, the, this, 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 I, I co-founded a chain of schools and very quickly we grew to 38 schools um, with nearly 20,000 children. We were focusing on the poor communities and very soon we realized that the cash flow of the poor is daily. So most of our mothers were uh, daily traders. Um, many of the fathers were absent. Um, but if they were working, they would also be daily paid or uh, yeah, uh, laborers, daily paid laborers, for instance. And we talked to parents and they said to us, the private schools, we want to send our children to private school, but the private schools, even for the poor, they charge fees termly every three months. So even though the fees might only be five to seven dollars per month, you've got to save up 15 to 20 dollars um, to pay the fees and if you're poor, it's always hard to save up money. You know, there's always other calls on your income. And if you're poor, then you pay the fees and then, then you get hit by other costs, the PTA fees, the, you've got to buy uniforms. So we listened to those problems and said, okay, why don't we create an all-inclusive daily fee? We worked out the total cost of schooling over the year, including uniform, books, transport, lunch, etc., etc., and we divided it by the number of days in the school year and the parents could come and pay that fee per day. This was amazingly popular. Um, when we first opened our schools, hundreds of parents wanted to come there. It's amazingly popular and terrible to administer. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. <laughs> but slowly we got used to different ways of organizing it and eventually we've got vendors in the community. They come to our head office, they buy what's well, really a currency, get into Omega school cards and then they sell them in the community including at the school gate in the morning so we can be cash free and we also give them one and a half percent commission so we again create new jobs in the communities. That's been very successful. Bridge I've been very quiet about but Bridge International Academies is now the largest chain of schools anywhere in the world. The co-founder Jay Kilmerman came to see me after I'd published this idea of chains of low-cost private schools. He came to see me and I recommended he open in Kenya and they're now 150,000 school 150,000 children around the world. Tremendously successful. And then I've created a couple of brands, the Cadmus brands as father mentioned. Um, there's one in Honduras, Cadmus um, academies and Cadmus education in, in uh, India. Cadmus education, a couple of years old, we've got 6,000 kids who are going to grow to about 50,000 hopefully soon. And uh, Cadmus in Honduras, just a year old, we've got two schools there in poor areas of Tegucigalpa. But let me finish by, well, just, first of all, just summarizing two things that I've occurred to me at four o'clock in the morning suffering from jet lag. You know, when outsiders get involved, I mean, this is trite in a way, but it's worth stating profit is good in these businesses. If any profit is reinvested in the education business in order to further improve the education and social impact already found in the sector, the sort of things I've been describing already. But it's also true, of course, that any profit is good if it's used as a signal to potential investors that the business is worth investing in to further improve the environment. So in other words, profit to me is a good, whether you give it in dividends or you reinvest it. So that much is clear, I think. But there are some problems when outsiders get involved. And the first one is definitely, it's a mea culpa, really. It's some, some people, like myself, perhaps got involved in the sector in order to prove the point. <laughs> I wanted to prove something about the role of education a role of government in education. You know, I was a philosopher of education. I wanted to prove some point about the role of government in education. And I was not really focused enough on profit. Too little focus on profit, I think, if you're in the for-profit business, can be a danger almost as much as too much focus on, on profit. I can discuss this one-on-one -on -one afterwards, but it's a bit like 
to me, it's just, I, you know, I didn't really care if my, the business was evaluated at half a million dollars or a million dollars. It didn't matter to me. It mattered very much to the business partners I was taking on this journey. I didn't really care if I put some money in and didn't sign a particular document. It mattered very much when later people are trying to work out what goes where in a business. So too little emphasis on profit can be a bad as well. But some of the some of the big providers are coming in are picking unnecessary fights with regulators and this is a serious problem. Let me finish by talking about regulations, regulations, regulations. These are perhaps one of the chief impediments in the private school market. Fortunately, regulations are bad on schools but there are federations of low-cost private school providers that have been created to fight some of these regulations. And this is a wonderful federation in Nigeria, the Association, it's a great Nigerian name, the Association of Formidable Education Development. This is the one that's got 5,000 members with nearly a million kids. And in case you can't spot me, I'm the one in the middle of that photograph. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and we're fighting and it's just come up we've got to fight another fight river state in nigeria now the oil rich state the governor there wants to close 2000 private schools another fight is on another struggle to try and convince them that these schools are worth protecting and i seem to be engaged in fights all the time here this is in india in punjab the punjab government has cl is closing 2000 local private schools so I was given this ceremonial dagger and I held it aloft perhaps unwisely um, saying we will fight <laughs> we will fight the government in closing these schools but let me close let me close by saying yes this is the most exciting exciting business to be involved in the most exciting journey to be involved in um, it's not always easy this is in Honduras in a very poor community if you know Central America the gangs are there, um, and this area was in Gang 18 territory. I think it's named after the 18th of November. And you could tell that because they, the gang throws tennis shoes over the, all, the, all the wires, and so you know that territory. Anyway, here we're just talking to the mothers about opening this new, very low-cost private school in this community, and we had a picture because all the mothers said they would send their children to this school. And then the guy who sent me this photograph, he did that red circle. He said, did you see the guy behind you? I said, no. And so I enlarged the photograph, and there is the guy behind me. He's a gang member going like this. Can you see him on the photograph? I don't know what that sign means, but I assume he was saying, you're very welcome in the community. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I took from that. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I'm glad to be speaking about putting good profit into action this morning. I was reminded earlier this week um, at a colloquium discussion on political economy that economists don't know anything about making money. <laughs> <laughs> I will volunteer of my own accord that economists are also not particularly practical people. We don't know much about putting anything into action. So, so, so I fear that my title might be the most le misleading title for this whole conference. And as they say, I'm also the only thing standing between you and lunch, and possibly your taxis to the airport. So these are two strikes against me. My goal then, uh, since it won't be about making money and it won't be particularly uh, uh, practical, is to provide a little material for reflection and maybe inspiration as you leave here. So I want to proceed where economists might be good, if they are good. And so I will begin by laying a little bit of ground, gr groundwork, quoting the best-loved passages about good economists. And this one, um, if I can do this well, there we go. So this is from Friedrich Bastiat's What is Seen and What is Not Seen, published in 1848. And he says, in the economic sphere, an act, a habit, or an institution, a law, produces not only one effect, but a series of effects. 
One of these effects, the first alone, is immediate. It appears simultaneously with its cause. It is seen. The other effects emerge only subsequently. They are not seen, and we are fortunate if we foresee them. There is only one difference, then, between a bad economist and a good one. The bad economist confines himself to the visible effect. The good economist takes into account both the effect that can be seen and those that must be foreseen. And this difference is tremendous. For it almost always happens that when the immediate consequence is favorable, the later consequences are disastrous, and vice versa. Whence it follows that the bad economist pursues a small present good followed by a great evil to come, and the good economist pursues a great good to come at the risk of small present evil or cost. Okay, so this is just groundwork for me. All right, so in the, in the interest of weaving things together, 160 years after Bastiat published this commentary on the 6th of September in 2008, the 23-year-old climber Alex Honnold recorded the following entry in his journal, 9608, regular north, northwest face, 511D, question mark, solo 250 en route, the 510 bypass, sketchy on the slab. So this is an image of what we're talking about sketchy on the slab. The regular northwest face refers to the northwest face of Half Dome, the iconic granite peak in Yosemite's National Park. The regular northwest face of Half Dome is about 2,200 vertical feet of climbing, if you want to climb it, <laughs> on surfaces that typically afford only the merest suggestion of handholds and footholds. The easy sections, like the one that you see in this photo, <laughs> contain long vertical cracks just big enough to insert one or two fingers. The difficult sections are wide flat slabs that often require the arduous skill of smearing. The smearing is the act of pressing one's sole uh, of the climbing shoe directly onto the rock or the slab and using friction only to propel oneself upwards. The northwest face of Half Dome is a route that only a small number of people will ever attempt in what is called a free climb which is with a harness clipped into ropes that are tacked up by the climber along the way up. In such a climb, the climber really does all the climbing. She never uses the ropes to bear her weight or to get over tough spots. And when one has completed a climb, one has really climbed it. It's sometimes said that the route has been freed. Um, I have other, okay, here's Half Dome, another picture of Half Dome. <clears throat> it's pretty iconic. It's, 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 uh, it's actually just gorgeous. And this is the, this is the route that um, he climbed. But on 9608, Alex Honnold ascended this route that you see here with no ropes and no harnesses. No ropes and no harnesses. This style of climb is called a free solo or free soloing. Earlier in the same year, on April 1st, Alex had catapulted to climbing fame for his free solo of the Moonlight Buttress in Zion Canyon. I think I have a picture of this. This is also Half Dome, sorry. Um, also Half Dome, and see why it's called Half Dome. Here's the Moonlight Buttress. Um, Moonlight Buttress is 1,200 feet tall. So John Long, who's one of the early climbers um, who pioneered a lot of the routes in Yosemite in the 70s, in the, in, um, had said of this climb of Half Dome, he said, there isn't anything I can think of that requires that level of concentration for that length of time with the penalty being certain death if you make a small mistake. Right, so that's pretty impressive, right? But I want to suggest that John Long might have done well to hold off on his comment. So four months ago from today, four months ago in early June of this year, Alex Honnold got up in the morning, drove into Yosemite. This is an easy section, by the way. Uh, put on his climbing shoes, chalked up, and climbed this rock, which is known as the Dawn Wall of El Capitan, without ropes. It took him four hours to free solo this 3,000 foot <laughs> piece of rock. Legendary climber Tommy Caldwell, who who's still, still climbs um, and climbs with Alex many times, he says this was the most significant event in the sport of climbing in all of his own 38 years that he can remember. This is written up in the New York Times afterwards in June. This is when I sort of started to think about it. In June, it was um, Daniel Duane writing in the New York Times said that this, was, this should have been celebrated as one of the greatest athletic feats of any kind, ever, right? 
So Duane argues, look, climbing has subdisciplines that call for different genetic traits and venerate different accomplishments. I don't know if you follow any of the documentaries of the climbers in, in the Himalayas, and you add all these difficult things of climbing along with the, the cold and the extreme. And he says, well, look, free soloing requires the capacity to tolerate, in addition to these things, the extreme fear of falling and sustain this over minutes and hours. Free soloing, he says, is a distillation of the entire climbing wor world's collective fantasy life. Vanishingly few elite climbers make careers out of free soloing, and plenty call it irresponsible and deplorable. But in their heart of hearts, they, re they all recognize it as the final word, I'm sorry, I'm quoting the New York Times, the final word in badassery. <laughs> In words somewhat more refined, we might say that free soloing is something like the platonic ideal of climbing. Duane concludes uh, his piece. He says, reasonable people consider products like, projects like these idiotic to the point of outrage. That is perfectly defensible. If you count yourself among those inclined to negative judgment, and even if you don't, I hope you'll indulge a mental exercise. Allow your mind to relax into the possibility that Honnold's climb was not at all reckless, that he really was born with unique neural architecture and physical gifts, and that his years of dedication really did develop those gifts to the point where he could not only make every move on Al Cap without rest, he could do so toler with a tolerably minuscule chance of falling. Viewed in that light, Honnold's free solo of El Cap represents a miraculous opportunity for the rest of us to experience what you might call the human sublime, a performance so far beyond our current understanding of our physical and mental potential that it provokes a pleasurable sensation of mystified awe right alongside inevitable nausea. <laughs> Let's see, I have a couple of other pictures here. This is the, this is the route that Alex climbed um, it's a, called the free rider route. There, there are dozens and dozens of routes up the El Cap. So the question I want to ask in the remainder of the time is why is this activity called free? As in free solo or free climb. And how is it related to great human achievement and the human sublime? So I say that, let's see, I've actually got a couple more photos here. I like this one because you can see, this is, this is Alex uh, climbing um, El Capitan, but with Half Dome in the back, so I might leave this here as a, as a backdrop for us. Here's another picture of him. Um, what else do I have here? So I'll, I'll leave this here to look at. So why is this called free? So I want to mark out um, at least four obvious attributes. Eventually I'll get around to profit, by the way, so <laughs> four obvious attributes. So the first is the willed and desired cultivation of unique cap capabilities, right? Unique talents. So there's, I mean, everybody recognizes there's something, you know, unique about, I mean, Alex has certain gifts and capacities that the rest of us don't have and the rest of climbers don't have. So the second, and I, I should almost put this first, is something like high risk, high reward. So certain death is a risk, yes, but also the pursuit of something noble and rare and valuable. And in this sense, value, we're thinking about value as something that's, um, that's, uh, that's related to its, its scarcity. It's, this is rare and noble. The third thing is obvious mental and physical suffering, so pain and hardship of the climb itself. And the fourth thing is this intense preparation. So free climbing, what we call free, without the ropes, um, without other assists, requires more preparation and not less. So the other three are a little bit evident already. Certain death, this is evident, high risk, special capabilities. But what about more preparation? I want to say something about this. So Duane writing about this says that Honnold re rehearses big free solos like this one. We, we think of genius sometimes and this kind of great accomplishment as something that people are inspired. They wake up in the morning and they just go out and do it. Um, we think we look at great athletes this way across the board, in fact. It's never true. So he says Honnold re rehearses his big free solos on ropes first. He commutes up and down cliffs with a lot of gear in order to work for entire days on small tricky sections. Um, I'm going to go back to this picture of the roots. Um, you can't maybe see 
the text in there, but it kind of points to these tricky sections. You know, here's a section where there's just nothing to hang on to. <laughs> just absolutely not. I mean, you think, like, how do you do this? So he'll, he'll rope himself up and then practice these sections for days. Um, Duane also says he memorizes long sequences of complex movement, like a middle schooler memorizing pi to 100 decimal places. He's methodically bested the marquee climbs of every Yosemite free soloist before him. And he spent years, years, quietly preparing himself for the free solo to end all free solos. In the final weeks, Honnold told me he climbed a particularly smooth stretch of the rock about 500 feet up on rope five times in a row with just his feet, no hands. I mean, so if you're going to put yourself up there with no ropes, I mean, you're going to make darn sure, like even if my hand doesn't work, my feet will make it. Th I mean, this is amazing. So I want to suggest here, as I've uh, suggested elsewhere, this point about preparation, um, that the great climbers of the world who consider free soloing the ideal of human achievement in climbing are not wrong. They're not wrong to call this freedom. For freedom in the human sphere involves a kind of fruitful marriage between human artistry, creative genius, and will, and the mastery of the building blocks of nature, what we might in other contexts call principles or rules. This conception of freedom is inherently connected to human achievement. There is no freedom, we would say, without mastery. You can't let go of the ropes unless you've really mastered this thing. But the greater the mastery, the greater the potential for human achievement. Mastery here isn't sufficient for human achievement, but it is necessary. So mastery together with human desire or will and genius, inherent capabilities, always combine in any case of genuine human accomplishment. What constitutes then great human achievement or great accomplishment? And it seems that great achievement is marked by having a lot of the four characteristics I mentioned earlier, suggesting that these things admit of degrees. There can be a great capability or a small one, a great talent or a small one, large risk and small risk, so much, much ventured and much gained, right? Great suffering and small suffering. And there can be great mastery and kind of mediocre mastery. So great achievement, what we all intuitively consider greatness, is marked by these things. For instance, a great achievement for a statesman would, would require, the, require the cultivation of natural talents and gifts, which of course has something to do with will as well, mastery of principles of rhetoric and negotiation, political acumen, but also for a great achievement. A statesman would have exercised this mastery in a time of crisis or high risk, right? You know, if there's nothing, nothing crazy happens in the political, it's hard to say this was a great statesman. We, we measure this greatness in respect to some um, crisis or time of high risk or high value. It was, it was absolutely clutch that you led us through this time, right? Without this leadership, we might have been on the brink of war. So a time when great value comes from the action. And finally, we would recognize that the effort required to achieve this result cost him a great deal of suffering. Therefore, we might rightly call most free those men and women whose accomplishments are most great. And this is kind of fascinating. And I think, well, it's why I've claimed just now that those who call Honnold's activity free are quite right. We might even go so far as to say that the greatest of the free solo climbers, Alex Honnold, is the freest climber we can think of. He might also be the craziest or the <laughs> most reckless, but <laughs> we're gonna set aside questions of ethics of climbing. So in the last remaining minutes I have with you, I want to turn to the consideration of good profit and a lot of what uh, Charles Koch put in his, in his book. Market-based uh, market management, he says, in the introduction to his book, is extremely powerful, but successfully applying it is neither simple nor easy. Okay, so you can start to see where I'm going with this. <laughs> After more than five decades spent developing and applying these principles at Koch, I've learned it's not enough to simply memorize the methodology or learn your way around the metaphorical toolbox. Successful application of market-based management requires internalizing its principles at all levels of the organization, especially in leadership. So it sounds like mastery to me. If you've never swung a golf club or driven a car before, theory and instruction only get you so far. You need to pick up a club and get behind the wheel and keep practicing and practicing until you internalize the mechanics to the point where you can do so automatically. It needs to become second nature to you. So this is what uh, Alex does. I mean, for whatever reason, this is second nature to him <laughs> at this point. Apparently, he, he was climbing since he was a small baby. I mean, he just, he was born to climb. 
we could spy then in this passage that Koch describes um, something that's kind of profound but it's easy to miss. And this is captured by the claim he makes later in more general terms, that there are real and existing principles that we might call rules or laws that govern the natural world and social reality, like, okay, the law of gravity is a real thing, and that these principles can be discovered by us, mastered through study and practice. But this is not limited to the natural world that we typically think of it. These things also apply to social institutions and business enterprises and society itself. And this is one of the, this is one of the kind of key unifying principles of good profit. So this leads me to my first principle, inspired by Bastiat, what is not seen. In Honnold's case, we intuitively and immediately notice that there are principles which govern his ability to balance and propel himself upward on great slabs of rock. Amazingly, when we look at the difference then between great businesses and poor ones, we often tend to think the difference is explained by luck or fate or a priori distribution of advantages and disadvantages. It's easier to see in the case of climbing. It's less easy to see in the case of business enterprise. Thus, good profit requires mastery of learned principles of success, learned principles of success. If Honnold climbs a section five times with just his feet, good profit requires hard work, hard practice. Anyone who's attempted golf knows just how apt Koch's golf example is. <laughs> there is no easy way to swing like a pro. And even with a great deal of talent, someone like Jordan Spieth, we have an insane number of practicing hours. No one can ever really appreciate, I mean, you just don't know. You don't want to know how much time these guys spend practicing. Um, they make it look easy. So what then about the characteristic of free activity that I highlighted as sort of suffering or pain or personal struggle? This too is implicit in the passage I quoted from Koch. And business, Koch says we aren't mastering or practicing something easy. Principles of market-based management, like the principles of a good golf swing, are difficult to execute even when the skills have been mastered and practiced. If this weren't true, then winning, winning major golf tournaments wouldn't be so elusive, even for the world's greatest masters of the game. And uh, there's lots of touching and kind of moving passages that uh, Alex writes about his climbs, you know, where even after executing everything, practicing, it, it costs him tremendous effort to accomplish these climbs. He gets to the top and kind of looks around at the top of a half dome and he looks around and he says, there's all these tourists up there because they can get up through a regular route, you know, the back of half dome. He kind of gets up, he said it was like parachuting out of, out of Vietnam into some, and he said these, these people with their cameras and they're munching on Doritos and they had no idea that he just almost died, you know, that he just <laughs> came through this thing. So, you know, but the execution of it, even with all that preparation, is still a tremendous amount of effort, right? Um, golfers who win a major tournament often report just kind of collapsing at the end of four days. It's a lot of sustained concentration over four days. So the physical exertion of a climb, like the free ascent of El Cap, as readily seen, we might even readily assess the mental effort of keeping something like maximal fear under control for a length of four hours, all while exerting maximal physical energy. When we look at successful businessmen, we don't readily see the days, the weeks, and the years of sustained concentration, the effort and the planning that go into the practice of the, we of the work, all while tolerating the fear, the natural fear of losing great capital, for example, committed to ventures. This doesn't only apply to the men and the women at the top. If market-based management is practiced correctly, each member of the firm community is an entrepreneur because he or she has property rights over her area and incentives that reward personal investment of time, energy, focus, execution. There is sacrifice and hardship at every level. What is not seen, what is not seen, the execution of learned mastery sustained over many uh, long periods of time reinforced in hundreds of decisions. This is the lifeblood of the business enterprise. You kind of know if you're going about it right, if it's hard, <laughs> it should be hard. The ideas of risk and value, or in Honnold's case, case, a certain death versus great honor, are readily applied to principled entrepreneurship. And like, there's another picture here, sort of look at the menacing rocks at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> in the first case, we know that business ventures necessarily involve risk of capital. Koch says, for instance, there were certainly times when fate was against us and our investments, despite all of our efforts, were unprofitable. But had we been unwilling or without sufficient capital to invest, we never would have distinguished ourselves from our competition. But the other side of the balance, which is the other side of the balance of risk is, is value, is 
kind of more interesting. Value is the thing that is noble, rare, and coveted, like climbing El Capitan. I would like to propose that it is the quest of creating real value for others and in consequence contributing to the overall development of persons um, that we would like to think about, this focus, f big focus of Koch's book. And I'm going to quote, he's, at, the, at the end he says, he had a letter from a former employee, many such letters. You had such a positive impact on me early in my career at Koch, says one of his employees, so much so that Sue and I named our first son after you. I know I never told this to you or anyone else. So this is, I mean, that's the quest, right? The quest is, pro profit, is um, right, profit is sort of symbolic of another set of things that are unseen. There's all this value, and value is, is unseen, and it's personal. So in business, unlike on granite, the crisis points or the fields for human greatness are usually hidden. Good profit market-based management, as Koch describes it, asks the businessmen get up every day, chalk up their hands, and take very seriously the ways that they impact the human beings they are responsible for, and I'm going to say responsible for. Real human lives and well-being depend upon it. And again, this is the importance of what is not seen. So finally, I want to mention the first aspect of this free activity that I talked about, the willed or desired cultivation of natural gifts and talents. Koch says at one point, by developing their individual capabilities, employees make a greater contribution, find greater fulfillment in work, and are more likely to reach their maximum potential. We strive to make career choices available to them based on their aptitudes and interests. OK, so far, so good. Um, and then he, sa he doesn't say so directly, but I will say that it seems that this principle is critical for the entrepreneur. I mean, Koch is not referring to himself in a certain sense, but that the field of free enterprise allowed him to develop his own genius, his own in, in, uh, innate capabilities. But here's an interesting thing, is that talents and capabilities are most often unseen. We don't always know what we're best at. Many people don't know, and as, uh, as Charles mentioned yesterday, school is often not a very good place to discover what you're good at. Um, it kind of tests and, and shows us a few narrow types of things. You could discover you're good at math problems, for example. But this is like a very narrow piece of the many, many varied types of things we might be really great at. We don't know. So how do we know what we're good at? How, how would I make a choice in favor of something I'm good at, unless we've had a chance to try many things? Athletic talents, like creative ones, require a field or a canvas or a big rock for discovery, practice, and execution. I suppose then that the pursuit of good profit, kind of vast free enterprise field, connects persons with their own innate talents or gives them the opportunity. Now, it, it's necessary in that that some people will be trying things that they're not good at, and then they learn this, and then there's a kind of a, a, a frustrating process, but this cannot be directed always with the kind of efficiency we would like. You try things and fail. So I want to say that economic theory, if you at least studied principles at some point, speaks of revealed preferences, that we have these subjective preferences and we don't always know them, but our, our choices in the market reveal our preferences. And I think that a good theory of free enterprise would speak of revealed talents, right? that this, this, um, this way of exercising human creativity in <laughs> in the business enterprise helps to reveal talents that we didn't know we had or others had. And this is a really splendid thing if you think about it, right? So to finish up, and I don't know if I have more pictures of Alex climbing here. This is just another one, give you a sense of how scary this looks. Um, those of you who started a business from the ground up know that this is probably pretty apt, right? <laughs> like really, really scary, right? So what I'm just sketching up to now it, you know, is something like a, a, an argument for what Koch calls good profit or what we might also want to call principled entrepreneurship, which I would like to say is something like the ordered experience, ordered, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for later, the rightly ordered experience of human freedom and economic initiative. I've kind of argued along the way that this rightly ordered human freedom in the economic sphere can aspire to what we consider great human achievement. Right? So when Duane, writing in the New York Times, said, well, you know, this should be considered one of the great feats of all time. I mean, building a great business is, can be considered one of the great human feats of all time. So it's ordered to this. The building of a great business corresponds to the richest and most intuitive notions of what we call free human activity. When I said that Honnold might be called the freest climber of all, I meant that he was more free. Yes, there are no ropes on me but also that his accomplishment freedom, I'm gonna smush them together, accomplishment freedom, depended on more work, more mastery, more sacrifice, and, the, and more kind of cultivation of natural gifts than all other climbers. 
So there's a, it's, this, is, this is special. It is, it is great, right? If this is true, we might say that what Koch tries to outline, a philosophy of free enterprise based in the wisdom of his father and developed over 60 plus years of study and hard work, it's something like the rules for free soloing in business. It's not just ordered to good profit, it's ordered to greatness. His father said to him, you can use this, you know, the capital I'm bequeathing to you, I'm leaving to you, you can use this capital as a valuable tool for accomplishment or you could squander it foolishly. If you choose to let this money destroy your initiative and independence, it will be a curse to you. I should regret very much to have you miss the glorious feeling of accomplishment. I know you are not going to let me down. That feeling of accomplishment is also not seen. And it comes, as Bastiat said, as the result of hundreds and thousands of small personal costs. Implicit in my argument for the relationship between free enterprise and human accomplishment is something like the Bastiat thesis. The good economist, Bastiat says, pursues a great good to come at the risk of small present cost. So also the good entrepreneur, putting, pro putting good profit into action requires just this, cultivating virtue, life of prayer, hard work, mastery, sweat, weariness, exhaustion, all in pursuit of a noble value that really serves, really is noble. Therefore, a better title for these remarks might have been in defense of what is not seen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Welcome. Jeffrey.